This is the I'm Possible Project show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just a state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivetall. Today, in episode 36, Suicide Prevention in Kansas with Kristen Vernon, I talk to Kristen Vernon. Let's jump right in. Kristen is a licensed specialist, clinical social worker, and has worked with individuals with exceptionalities, educators, direct care providers, and parents for approximately 22 years. She received her Bachelor's of Social Work and her Master of Social Work at the University of Kansas and is licensed to the Behavioral Sciences Review Board. She is the Clinical Director at Social Perspective, a private counseling practice, and began volunteering at Headquarters Counseling Center in Kansas in 2005 as a crisis and suicide prevention counselor and currently serves as Director of Clinical Services for Headquarters Counseling Center. I actually got to meet Kristen. I spoke at the University of Kansas. And she was there, and she helped facilitate that. And so it was really cool to get a chance to meet her and to chat afterwards. But Kristen, I'm glad we get to continue the conversation. I'm I'm so grateful to have you on the show today. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm glad to continue our conversation as well. I love I love in your bio how you work with people with exceptionalities. Like I have so many exceptionalities. It's no, I, I don't know what that even means, but I think it's cool. Good writing. So um, <laughs> thanks. That's your bio. You know, you're more than just all that professional stuff. So if you wouldn't mind, for for my curiosity and and also the curiosity of our our listeners, would you mind giving us a little background on your life, where you've been, where you're going, the Kristen Vernon experience? (laughs) Sure. Hmm. Um, So I was born in Oregon, and we bounced around a lot. I was the first child, and... We we moved from Oregon to California to Colorado to California to Michigan to California to Kansas and eventually settled in Kansas. But my parents were teaching parents group homes for adolescent teenage kids who had been removed from their home. And so I spent my first two and a half years living in a group home with about eight teenage boys that were considered juvenile offenders. So I essentially grew up, at least in that part, with eight big brothers who were awesome. My first word was one of their names, which was Bob. (laughs) And then we, like, when they stopped being teaching parents, they went on to be the director of different teaching homes and then eventually a teaching family site. They both got their bachelor's in psychology and then their master's in psychology. And then we're working on their PhDs in child and developmental psychology. And my mom got hers. My dad never finished his. So I kind of grew up around helping people. Eventually, I started working in a group home and moved to Michigan when I was in my 20s to work at this site that they started, which was a bunch of group homes all over upper Michigan. And so I very much, especially my mom, followed in my mom's footsteps and discovered that social work was kind of the gateway degree as far as being able to do things that I wanted to do and be able to have options and stuff. So I moved back here to be with my family and got my bachelor's and then quickly followed by my master's in social work. And in that time period, started working as a volunteer at headquarters, like you said in my bio. But in the in the interim, I ended up with seven younger brothers and sisters through different marriages and stuff. So I'm definitely a big sister. My siblings are between six and 19 years younger than I am. So siblings and family have always been a really big part of my life. And my childhood was both awesome and traumatic. My mom is fantastic. My dad tried really hard to be a good person, but like failed spectacularly at home. And we were just in the process of seeing what our relationship could look like when I was, when I was 20 and trying to figure out what being adults looked like for our lives and being a part of my siblings' lives and how that fit in with my dad and all of that kind of stuff. And he killed himself in December when I was 20. And so that, in a lot of ways, changed the trajectory of what sort of I envisioned, obviously, what I envisioned my life and my siblings' life as. But it also, well, I will tell you that when I started working at headquarters as a volunteer, it was not because I had a burning desire to help with suicide prevention. That wasn't even really on my radar. My goal was to do something different than what I had done 
as like direct, something different than direct care because I was very, like I'd been working in group homes and stuff. It wasn't until our like super intense training that I really dug into suicide prevention and intervention and what that meant like for my life and for my dad's life and for like the ramifications really of that on my family and myself. And so I've been here ever since. So I definitely found a calling in it at here as in headquarters ever since and have definitely lost a couple of colleagues to suicide since I've been here and really recently a family member to suicide. And so it's definitely been, unfortunately, a theme in my life. But also I think, I like I said, I've found a, a calling for it and I'm passionate about it. And so I think that it's a part of my life, whether I no matter what. So that's sort of me in a nutshell. I feel like I talked for a really long time. <laughs> that's all right. That's what we're here to do. We're here to, <laughs> to listen to you talk. <laughs> Fair <humble>. enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's quite a nutshell. It's a lot to chew on. And there's so many, there's so many, so many components to your life that I find fascinating, interesting. And I've got a lot of questions and a couple of comments, and I'll start with the comments because they're they're a little less in depth. They're very surfacey. But you were like you were like a child social worker. Like I mean, growing up in that environment, which must have been interesting and maybe a little tiring, I would imagine, in in certain senses. Because there's whether you like it or not, you're probably helping people. I, I would think, or or watching your parents do that. Did you? Uh, this this isn't really the theme of the show, or or I'm just kind of curious. Did you? Uh-huh. This is just something I'm pulling out of nowhere, and, and and probably we won't connect it to. We might connect it to the rest of the conversation, but <laughs> did you ever find because they had eight kids that they were helping? Did you ever feel like, well, what the hell about me? Where am I? Where do I fit in? in all this? Like, did they have enough left over for you after they were done helping people? Yeah. I, I mean, my mom, especially my, my dad, not at that point, but later on in my life, my dad struggled a lot with a lot of different things. And so, and he took that out a lot on, on the family, but my mom for sure did. But at that time when I was living in the group home and stuff, they had it at such a family environment that I've spent a lot of time both with them, but also with the boys. And they they did a really good job of making me feel like I was constantly surrounded by love and input and, you know, simulation and stuff. And so it I don't remember a lot of it because I was really young, but I have really fond memories of it and can name kids and stuff. And so it definitely made a big impression. And then as the years went by, I... I waffled between whether or not I wanted to like do what they did or something completely different. So I, I definitely thought about being a veterinarian for a while and then ended up being a social worker. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you, uh, you almost chose something where you didn't have to hear anyone talk. Yes. Uh, other, <laughs> quite, yeah. quite a contrasting spectrum. Um, your dad seems like a very uh-huh. interesting character in your life and in the scheme of the world. People are so complex. I mean, yeah. people are just walking contradiction and a whole ball of cognitive dissonance, as it were. How do you think your dad could have been someone helping so many people yet failed to help himself? What do you think that comes from? And how did that... Let's start there. Um, I really, you know, there's the... What is that? The heal thyself kind of addition adage to thyself. that... Yeah. You know, I really... Look, I've had a lot of time to reflect on my dad over the years, a lot of therapy. And I think that he desperately wanted to help people and that he wanted to be a good person, but had a really difficult childhood. And then that was all compounded by being in Vietnam. And when he when he left Vietnam, I think had a really like, none of this matters anyway kind of feeling. So while he did a lot for other people and like, really changed the game in some some senses as far as like how we interact with with kids and help them learn through social skills and stuff. He just couldn't keep it together at home. And I, f- I feel like, and I've always felt like it was just that he was so, that he was plagued by so many of his memories and mental illness and things that he was never, never willing to admit. So he was somebody who, you know, it was suggested to him at one point that he join like a support group for like soldiers who had been to Vietnam. And he, his response to that was, well, only if I can lead the group, because I'm, I have a lot more to give from a leading perspective than a, from a support and getting help perspective. 
which was kind of his MO going through life, that he he didn't feel like he had anything to offer or was able to ask for help. And so he channeled all of his energy into helping other people, like specifically kids, and then just wrestled and struggled when he got home. How interesting, compl- interestingly complex in the sense that there is that physician heal thyself. And I'm just thinking about people uh, and, and and certainly myself, I've I've had these moments in my life where I'm only willing to lead. I'm only willing to, but wait a minute, I need to learn as well. And sometimes, sometimes you can learn as a leader, but sometimes you learn by taking a back seat. And we, we as helpers and people in, in this field and beyond, there's other helping fields. We sometimes get this compassion fatigue where we're trying to help so many people and we forget to help ourselves. And even if helping is setting boundaries or going to that support group and sitting there and shutting the hell up and just listening. Uh-huh. Uh, Cause I know I sure as hell like to talk. Uh, we're damn lucky. This is an interview format. Otherwise, <laughs> wouldn't be pretty. but uh sounds like a, a very complex, interesting human being. And oh, well, a reminder that self-care is tremendously important. Yeah. And we as helpers and we, in whatever role we're playing in within our families, our communities, our jobs, that we need to take care of ourselves. Otherwise, we're not going to be good for anyone else. And if, if you're dad, and this is kind of just a, something for the listeners rather than maybe for you, because you've probably already thought about this, but if your dad was able to practice self-care, if he found the capacity and then found the capacity to reach out and ask for help, he could have helped so many more people. Mm-hmm. And we want that's what we want to do. We want to, you know, uh, us who, who are empathetic, empaths, I guess, want to save the world. And we can't do that if we're running on 20% steam, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it also reminds, and, and it's just a uh, something for me to hear about my own dad because he was so. Our my touch point in life, in early life, wasn't counseling or therapy or group homes. It was like this really extreme form of church, and and so that's where we went like all the time, like four or five times a week. And then I went to school there, and so when I saw my dad interact with all these people and sort of a ministry level and these other things, it was like, wow, well. He's so cool to everyone else and wants to help, but he sure doesn't want to help me and wants to make fun of me and all these things that kind of went into that. Mm -hmm. But there were so many things that he was dealing with that he wasn't dealing with. So just kind of a reminder, you know, to not give the man a free pass, but another reminder of empathy and and to empathize with what a person's going through. Yeah, Um, absolutely. I I will say that I that I struggled for a long time and still do at times, but I definitely have a different perspective now, but struggle with a a lot of, if you recognize the impact of these parenting choices on the kids that Mm -hmm. you were working with, then how did that translate into that being okay for you at home, right? But I think that there was much more, like you said in the beginning, there was much more cognitive dissonance than that, that it wasn't that one didn't necessarily reflect the other. Not that I'm taking responsibility away from his actions or anything, but I think there was a whole lot more at play than just simply, like, being good to the public and being bad at home, you know? So it's right. more nuanced right. than that everything is. But Fast forwarding then to age 20, you lose your dad to suicide. I'm sorry for your loss. It's been some time now, but it needs to be said. Um yeah, and so what did that do to your life at age 20? How did that manifest for that, that period of time? I was, like, the, the, the most stark in that moment was that I was living in Ohio, engaged, and that definitely, my relationship blew up. In retrospect, <laughs> that, that wasn't a bad thing that it did, because it wasn't, that, that whole thing, I was too young and it was too fast, but at that moment felt like I, you know, lost my dad to suicide and then my relationship ended because it it couldn't work through that. And he, at the time, I didn't connect it as well, but he had lost his own dad to suicide, like when he was very young. And so it, of course, imploded our relationship. But at least at 20, when we had a really hard time, like just dealing with our emotions in general. So I moved from Ohio to home and then like moved in with friends in Oklahoma for a couple of months and that was a disaster and so it was really like I really wanted to be there for my family and I wanted to be there 
from my siblings and also found myself just like f- bouncing around and trying to like trying to find grounding, trying to find roots. And I, you know, I think that I spent a, like a, a lot of time reading at that point, just like book after book after book, trying to not not be in the moment while also spending a lot of time talking to my siblings about like what if if there's reincarnation and if he was reincarnated what would that be like and you know just trying at 20 to work through it with my siblings who are much younger but it definitely they tell you not to do any big things after you suffer a major loss and I like ended my relationship and moved across the country and then moved across the country again and then well, no, a state over, and then move back. And so, yeah, I didn't listen to any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the ripple effect of making those decisions, was it initially positive, negative, and then the aftermath? I mean, because there's a reason why they ask you not to make big decisions. <laughs> yes. did, you, did you find that that was very clear some months or years later? I made some... I made some really, like, fast decisions that I was really adamant about that I probably would have thought and talked through in a different way had I not been, like, completely overwhelmed with grief and, like, shock. In the end, I sort of chalked it up to, like, experience and that it was probably better that that relationship ended and then I moved home and stuff. But, like, initially it was was pretty... There are a lot of ripples as far as the ripple effect goes. And I was overwhelmed with trying to find work and trying to manage just myself and my life and be a productive member of society and stuff. And so kind of immediately it was really, they were pretty poor decisions (laughs) because I didn't have any plan going from one thing to another. Like I said, in the years since, I've been able to look back and see where there was where it pointed me in a different direction and I was able to find some really important pieces of my life in that period. But in the moment, it just felt so chaotic and out of control. It makes sense. Trauma brain is those funny things. You forget things, you you lose track of things. You, I mean, this, it, it just, it, it affects every component of your life. I mean, the shock, the grief, you throw that on top of it. And then you're 20, so your brain isn't done developing on top right. of all of that. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, what a what a traumatic and difficult, to say the least, period of time in your life. Now, fast forward a little bit in that period and your loss, the loss of your father in such a traumatic way. How has that informed your life since then? And how does it inform your work now? I think that, so it, it, I was definitely like in, in the moment I was not able to consider any of that beyond just, like I said, sort of talking to my brother. I remember sitting, talking to my brother about reincarnation and if, if that was what we believed, because my family was not religious at all. And so we were really struggled to find meaning in that and the fact that he died by suicide and the fact that he died at all, like what what happened after that. And so we were sitting talking about like, do we believe in reincarnation or do we believe in like eternal nothingness and, and what? And he he was 14 at the time and an ant crawled over his leg and he smacked it as it was walking over. And this was like three days after we found out about my dad and he smacked it as it was walking over his leg. And then he got this like terrified look on his face and looked at me and said, what if that was dad? And I said, <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess if it was that he gets to come back as something more interesting than ants next time. <laughs> so <laughs> we we tried as a family to have a lot of levity, but that was really, it, it had its upsides and its downsides. I think that it shaped, I don't, I, I'm trying to remember how thoughtful I was between like 20 and 25 about that impact. I had a, a lot of guilt because like I said, my dad and I were trying to, figure out if there was a relationship to be had as adults. And it felt like right in the middle of that process of trying to figure out that what was going on and trying to build something and and stuff that he made, he made this choice and that, that I, had we been closer or had our lives been different or had stuff happened in a different way that I would have been able to somehow like step in and stop him. But I, I didn't carry that for very long because I also understood firsthand that there was a lot happening in his life and that there was a lot happening in his 
brain. And so I wrestled with it for a while and then worked really hard not to anymore. But I also think that I put it away and didn't thought more about just him not being around and less about how he wasn't around, why he wasn't around, if that makes sense. That my focus was more on, oh, I miss the option of having a dad and being able to talk to a dad versus I am really thoughtful about suicide and suicide prevention and stuff. It really wasn't until I started at headquarters and went through training when they were asking us to be real, like, open about anybody that we'd lost to suicide that I connected the very reality that he killed himself and that he made a choice and that that impacted our entire family forever. You know, my some of my siblings were two and three and four, and they spent their whole life without having a dad, and so that was a very different experience than... I had because I spent my childhood with a dad and it wasn't great. And so that has always been an interesting thing in our lives to try to like work out and deal with. And and I think that we're all closer because of that, but we all have such different perspectives of who he was and the man that he was and who he, they idolized him to be and, and all of that stuff. But like I said, when I started training, I really, like, really started thinking about the impact of his suicide on our lives and on my life and what that meant for the work that I wanted to do. And I think that I understood very well that I had a, a perspective that was important for this work in that I I saw my family sort of blow up and then come back together and all of the different ways that people dealt with it on different levels, like his bio family just just did not deal with it at all. Like never talked about it, never wanted to talk about it, his mom and his sisters and stuff. And it was just a complete like shutdown of communication and stuff. Me and my brothers and my mom talked about it a lot and tried to like work through it a lot. My stepmom and I talked about it quite a bit. So I, I just watched all of these different like units within our family deal with it and be really devastated by it in different ways. And I try very hard to keep that at the front of my mind when I'm talking to people about suicide and suicide intervention and prevention and what what that can look like. You know, that on the outside here is this man who was very successfully working with children in group homes and, and stuff for a long time. And then it turns out all of these things were happening in his life. And then like the follow-up to that was not for him to get treatment or help or anything like that. The follow-up to that was for him to kill himself. And so that's also another, like, you never know what's happening in somebody's life. You never know a person's full story by what they're, what they're willing to, to say on the outside or by the work that they do or anything like that, that there's always something going on and that we don't know the story of the person next to us unless we ask. And so that's a very present in my work, especially at headquarters, but also in private practice, of course. I did that. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> no, it was a terrible answer. No, it was great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your, your stepmom, your mom, everybody had a different experience. In my world, there's a, a sister and a brother, my sister and brother and my mom. And uh, and I wrote a play eight, eight years ago, just right around the same time I lost my dad. You actually saw it at, at uh, mm-hmm. University of Kansas. And that's my perspective. And if it was from the perspective of my brother, my sister, my mom, if they were all players, it'd be four different plays, you know? Right, so, exactly. Yep. So that's interesting that each of your siblings, your mom, your stepmom, they're all survivors of loss. They all have different experiences and they all have different needs mm-hmm. and different ways of handling it, different ways that they need to handle it. So I see that as, as another reminder that our work and our help offering needs to look different to different people because of the different experiences in, in this, even within the same family, and then let alone losing a, a son, losing a parent, losing a grandparent, losing a cousin, whatever. So, and that's why I'm grateful for the work of you and, and people all around the country who do have different perspectives and then they're filling in these gaps in different places in the ways that they know how. And having been through what you've been through, the traumatic experience and experiences that you had to overcome as a young person, would you say that it makes you more more adept, a better clinician, a better listener, a better empath? You're better equipped to help people. Is it a detriment in your work? Do you think you can speak or end or listen from a better platform? I just want to dig a little bit deeper into... Yeah. Because there used to be this paradigm where, and that's 
I hate that buzzword, but I said it anyway, paradigm <laughs> where, where A, you couldn't self-disclose if you were a clinician or a social worker about any sort of traumatic experience, let alone suicide. And then you couldn't disclose it in your work, even if it was for the benefit of the client. So with that being said, it seems to me that you probably fall under this new way of thinking. And so if that's the case, how has your liability become an asset in your work? Um, I That's such a good question because I grapple with that, like, uh, regularly. I think that I that I absolutely listen in a different way and, and help in a different way because of all of those experiences. I definitely, you know, when I set out to do, when I set out to do private practice and, and just to counsel that my, like, I I definitely had a path of working with people who experienced trauma because in in my head as we as we start talking about their life and what happened and what was traumatic I see a a path I understand where like this feeling is coming from I understand where how you got from there to here and how you move forward and what that means. And, you know, like I said, of course, everybody is different. Of course, everybody has a perspective and a story. And it's incredibly important to hear that and to, to like take that as a gift that somebody is giving and being able to talk about it and stuff. But as I hear that, I really see, like I said, I sort of see it as a roadmap and, and understand it, at least from my perspective. And I attribute that a lot to my experiences, of course, and lived experience and all of that. I think that there's a huge, there, a lot of my work is from like a lived experience place that it, if that if that's where my empathy comes from in a lot of ways. I think it was also nurtured there from a, like my parents were, <laughs> my parents were helping people. And like you said, I sort of was a social worker from the start. And so empathy was just was just there and built there, but the building on it was definitely trauma and experiences and all of that. Um, when I went into, when I entered into the social work program, I was very cognizant of the clinician and the social worker that I wanted to be, that I wanted to be very careful that I wasn't engaging people in an effort to fix myself, that I wasn't doing the work in an effort to make it about me. And so I think that sometimes I lean towards being too cautious about sharing my experiences because I never want it I never want to make it about me. But parallel processing is a really real part of how we talk to people. Like you you hear things that you relate to when you're talking to people and your ability to be able to process that alongside with them is it's pretty important as a clinician because otherwise you get all up in your feelings and again, you make it about you and not them. And so being able to say when you leave that session or when you're reflecting on it later to be able to say, I really related to this because of this and this. And am I coming from my point of view or their point of view? Am I giving them space to be themselves and to have their own story and that kind of stuff? I definitely, I definitely think that, any lived experience is incredibly valuable. I absolutely fall into that camp that that we that we learn and grow from each other and our experiences way better than like the old way of sitting in a room and not being a person, <laughs> like just being a clinician who only is willing to hear their story and has that wall up because I think that you have to be humanized to be able to like connect with people. But like I said, I do struggle with that. I, I will always have like ongoing supervision and consultation, even in private practice, because I think that one, we shouldn't practice by ourselves without anybody to talk to because then we get stuck in ruts and stuff. But two, because of that struggle, like because I want to be able to walk the line between making it about myself and being truly there to help somebody else. And my supervisor always tells me that I err too much on the side of like holding back. <laughs> so I, that's, I work on that pretty regularly because I think that it can be it's like that, like I said, that humanizing piece, right? Like if the person sitting across from you in a therapy session or talking to you on the phone knows that you at least relate to their experience in some way, that it a lot of times makes it easier to to feel okay opening up. It helps normalize things. It, you know, I, I think it allows for communication and connection and rapport building in a really different way. 
but I struggle with it, like I said. So what I heard was that the lived expertise and the lived experience informs in generally a positive way and that it helps your work. And I would, going beyond that and, and, and tying into what you said toward the end, there is an element of rapport building because with when I go to see a therapist, I want to know that on some level, some level they're able to relate to me and either they're a person or, you know, which, which falls beyond the, the old guard of, you know, I'm going to sit in a room and ask someone how it makes them feel 10 times right. and hope to God that they get something out of it, which is complete bullshit uh, or <laughs> partial bullshit. But um, yeah. I, I want to know, I mean, that's how adults learn by relating to things that they hear. They don't, like if they just don't, they don't learn in that way. If if it's not applicable to their life or it doesn't relate, the brain doesn't process the, that information. It goes in one ear and out the other. That's why lecture and regurgitation aren't great learning styles. So, uh, or teaching styles rather. So I would say if if I was in a therapy session with you and I had just lost my dad, I'd probably want to know. I, I know in the therapy session, you don't, you don't you don't want to give a ton of advice unless it's solicited, and even then there's still a fine line. But mm-hmm. I'm going to want to know what you've been through and how you handled it, and then have the permission to take what I like and leave the rest. And I think what what the fine line is as far as disclosing is just being well aware and being in that space. And you kind of said it that it's for the listener's benefit and not your own. And right. as soon as it starts to cross into that territory, even like with one toe over that line, time to pull back and reassess in that moment. And that's a that's a skill and that's an art and that's a science. So there's there's I, I can see where there's a difficulty to that as well. But the supervision I really like. I think that's really interesting. Um, I've never had more than one person sitting in and you know, the only person was my my own therapist. So um, I think that could be interesting and fascinating. But we well, but I think the relationship. Oh, I was just going to say that he that I take it back to him, right? So my clients know that I have a a consultation person, but he, but it's never he's never in the same room at the same time. But I do talk to him when I'm stuck on things or when I feel like I'm in a rut or when I'm saying things funny, <laughs> um, <laughs> or when I'm struggling with trying to figure out if I've if if I this is the time and stuff mm. to self disclose and and that and I I really. I've been doing this for a while now, and so I feel like I have a better grasp on that. And you're absolutely right. Like, it is so important to be able to connect with people. And part of that is being able to share something, right? And, yeah, it's about intention. What is the purpose of my sharing? Am I doing it because I have to tell them this thing? (laughs) Or am I doing it because it feels like that connection is important and that's how we move forward? I almost, uh, just a comment, I almost feel like this just came to mind that therapists would do well, would be served well with maybe some kind of continuing education course on storytelling. Because if you look, and, yeah. and, it, and it could be memoir style, it could be TV style, because there's elements where that, I think, to Breaking Bad for, for a minute, in terms of their storytelling style, where they told you just enough of what you needed to know, and then they let you the viewer fill in the blanks and there's real power in that because we as human beings also need to utilize our creativity and our problem solving skills and 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 so giving just enough information kind of bringing go back to therapy it kind of allows and, and it honors a person's intelligence to have those aha moments it could be interesting moving right along this totally falls into the realm because we didn't really plot this out i didn't really i kind of gave a little thought as to where I'd like this to go. And it went sort of in that direction. It went in different directions. And that's cool. That's what a, an organic conversation does and what happens. But what happens on the show is we talk about obstacles and then kind of turning, I, I already said it, like a, a liability to an asset, lemons and mm-hmm. lemonade. And you've done that with your life. And so just need to acknowledge that for, for a moment. And then because we talk about such deep things and we talk about generally like one side of a person when we're on this show and it usually has to do with some kind of social justice or difficulty or what have you, we got to have some fun. Mm-hmm. And not that that part isn't fun, but we got to have some pure fun and we got to let people know a different side of you because we are, we are, we're not just 
a therapist or a sister or the lost survivor. We're all these different things. So this is a quick yeah. fire round. This is kind of like the Tonight Show or um, <laughs> Conan. So we're going to have some fun. I'm going to ask you some questions, and there's no right or wrong answers. They're just fun. So don't worry about it, and we could, you know, we'll figure it out on the fly. Okay. So, Kristen, what is your favorite word? Um, other than swear words, I, my favorite sounding word is facetious. Facetious. Oh, I like that word. It's, it's, it's fun to say. A fun one. Yeah. Hard to spell. Somewhat. Yes. <laughs> facetious. But I was just being facetious anyway. I know how to spell it. Using uh, in a sentence. Hashtag smart well, guy. Um, well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, appreciate that. Validation is good. So, um, consequently, or conversely, uh-huh. what is your least favorite word? I really feel like I should say suicide because that is my job and so much of my story, but I really, really hate the word panties. I really hate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first on the show, panties. Yeah. <laughs> It's a weird word. I had some friends, some some girlfriends, not a girlfriend, but girlfriends in high school that were like, I hate the word panties. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I like the word panties either. But I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm ambiguous to it. Mm. Must be nice. Have, I mean, I guess some boys have panties, I suppose. Uh, anybody can have panties, but let's call it what they are. Call You've it said it so Lord. many times. <laughs> I know. I'm totally not respecting your, <laughs> your likes and dislikes. Right? Apologies. All right. So uh-huh. if somebody were to create a movie of your life, Kristen Vernon, no panties, please. That's a subtitle. No, I can't say this. So the Kristen <laughs> Vernon. <laughs> Just got real a terrible title for a movie. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so if somebody were to create the Kristen Vernon lifetime movie special, who would play the title role? Oh, I, I knew that's where you were going with this. That just, it feels so... Like, I don't know, self-indulgent. I don't know if that's the right word um, oh. to pick a star, but it's a really good question, but it's a really hard question. Um, pick a star. Pick a star. Huh? You're not going to pick somebody. You're not going to pick somebody from the lo- local high school musical. Pick a star, for God's sake. Nobody knows who that person is. <laughs> the massive Pequa High School production of Grease. <laughs> <laughs> James Stevenson. Like, yeah. Um... Meg Ryan, I decided just now. I like Meg Ryan. Mm-hmm. She, can, she, she can do that. Like, City of Angels was one of my, like, go-to, like, emotion movies. Like, if I needed to cry mm. and also be impressed with the cinematography, then City of oh. Angels, so. Oh, you're displaying a complexity. <laughs> photography. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> and who does that? Director of photography. No, um, anyway, so... We're going to have to figure out a way to get Tom Hanks into this film, so that's up to you as you write that screenplay. I'm challenging you to it. But okay, Meg fair Ryan enough. stars in the, the Kristen Vernon story, A Cautionary Tale. No, I'm not going to yeah. Is she even? I don't even know if she's around anymore. If she, if she does stuff. She's recovering I, from some bad, some bad work done on her face. Yes, that's true. She's, she's around. I feel like I'm going to think about this answer. Like Out of all of the things that we talked about, this is the one where I'm going to like – perseverate on it when we're done and be like, mm. oh, I shouldn't have said, I should have said this person, but I'm, I'm sticking, Meg I Ryan, think, I'm sticking to you. I think if Meg isn't available, we go with Jane Adams. I don't know, for some reason, her voice and your voice sound very similar. I would say books, if you know who Jane Adams is. She was on the HBO series Hung, and then she's done a lot of theater and a lot of, like, she's more like upper-level TV, solid guest starring sort of things, like the most famous person on SVU is always the protagonist or antagonist, like surprise, surprise, you know, uh-huh. kind of a yeah. deal. So that's, that's Jane Adams. But, um, I'm, anywho, all right. I we'll, feel uh, like we'll, we should we'll, just we'll, go with your answer. Pontificate. No, anyway. I'm, I'm, stick with, I'm gonna stick with Meg Ryan. We can, maybe we'll get Jane in as, uh, some ancillary character. Or maybe she'll oh, just, just work on. I just searched Jane Adams. I know who she is. I'm good with that. Noise. <laughs> all right. Solid. <laughs> Well, that's if we can't if we can't get Meg or if she's asking for too much money, so, or she's still in hiding. It. Whatever's happening, yeah. Word, all of it. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> two more questions. All right. Okay. So, who or what is your spirit animal? Um, yeah, I am. I'm a dog and animal lover, but I would say from like a spirit animal standpoint, probably dolphins. Or there was Ooh. a lot of like when we. Spread my dad's ashes. We 
that are in California where he grew up. And we took like a boat out onto the ocean and there was like a whole dolphin experience that happened like really organically that, that happened at the same time. And so that definitely yeah, cool. like really resonated with me. And then I've held on to that for 20 years. So, Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And, uh, and dolphins are in te- incredibly intelligent. They're mammals. Never had any dolphin cheese, but still. But they're mammals. And uh, they're just interesting characters in this circle of life. So, cool yeah. beans. All right, last one. If heaven exists, if heaven uh-huh. exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter or as you get kicked out? Good try. <laughs> Either that or... <laughs> <laughs> Either that or gla- grab a clipboard and get to work, but I really yeah. like good try. You, the... you were mediocre. I guess huh? you can come in. Yeah. <laughs> you were mediocre. I guess you can come on in. <laughs> you you clearly tried really hard, lady. So God, God gives out participation trophies. <laughs> 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 Probably like only fair. And falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> the really, really like generic ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Best crier. It's the baseball team. <laughs> oh. Most dramatic. <laughs> right. So that's the end of the quick spot round. Kristen, what is the next maybe six months to a year hold for you, personally, professionally, whatever you want to dig into and want to share? What's what's going down in the next six months to a year for you? Well, like the, the biggest thing on my radar where we – four or five of us at the office and then all of our volunteers have all of our fingers and toes crossed for. We submitted a grant in, I don't know, April, March to a foundation to try to get the money to do a peer line here at headquarters. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is to have teenagers like between the ages of 14 and 18 answering the phone for kids. Um, And so there aren't very many agencies around the country that do that. And I, in all of the talking and panels and trainings and stuff that we've done, like it's, there's a huge gap for kids to feel like they have somebody to connect to. And they have said kind of over and over, it needs to be other kids. Adults are tough. (laughs) Um, And so we, you know, created this program and have been working ever since to get it funded. But I think that this is our best like our best chance currently. And so we find out about that in August and we're we're all using the power of positive thinking and have just decided that we're getting it. (laughs) Um, So yeah, that's, that's like professionally, um, we're really passionate about that, this peer line and being able to talk to kids and in a different way and train kids and have kids as like ambassadors who are able to go to their schools and talk about crisis intervention and prevention and suicide prevention and stuff. So that is, that's the, like the thing right now. Yeah. And I'm, Oh my gosh. Super excited. Yeah. I love, love, love that idea. Cause there isn't enough of that out there via, you know, in that sense. And there isn't enough being done on social media, like kind of on the back end. So you were definitely covering a huge gap and, I think if 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 I or any of the listeners can send good vibes or help in a tangible way, you know that's uh, that's definitely something we can do or we will do because that's such important work. If uh, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, maybe to holler at you for some private practice or want to figure out how to get in touch or maybe donate to headquarters or or whatever, uh, is is there a good way to do that? And if so, what's the what's maybe the best way or two ways or something like that? So. Private practice wise, I'm just Kristen dot Vernon at Gmail and then headquarters. I have the longest email address ever, which is Kristen sure <laughs> Kristen at headquarters counseling center dot org. But both of those places, social perspective um is the private practice, social perspective dot org and then headquarters counseling center dot org are both the, <laughs> the websites for those. <laughs> It makes me laugh like every time I tell someone. <laughs> We're the best. No, really, we are. Dot org. No, no, no. Yeah. We'll make sure to get the proper link in there for the show notes. See, we don't even like say our name out like that. We oftentimes say HQ or HQCC. So why we have a fifty-eight thousand word email address and website? I don't know, but we do. So there you have because it. Because you have a very ancient 
web design, I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> yes, so that's true. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> But this was great, Chris, and I, I so appreciate you and your work and what you're doing and who you are and uh, and just appreciate you coming on the show today. Really loved well, it. It was a treat. Thank you very much. I have been talking about you in all of my circles since we met at KU because I'm so impressed by you and your show and everything that you're doing. So I'm, you could say I'm kind of a fangirl, but... <laughs> Oh, um, golly, geez. I'm <laughs> blushing and, and, and looking down and kicking stones right now. But you can't see Perfect. That. That's exactly the image that I was going for. <laughs> so. Thank you. That means a lot. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project Show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Kristen Vernon. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm Possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are available right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of the I'm Possible Project. That's IAMPossibleProject.com slash 2 slash T-W-O or IAMPossibleProject.com slash Lemonade. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love.